Hello, everyone. Today on the final bar, the market's recovering nicely from an initial sell-off. The S&P 500, again, teasing that 4,500 level. We're going to dig a little deeper into market breadth conditions, look at some of the key indicators that have rotated from bullish to bearish. Finally, healthcare moving up in a big way, financials and materials moving down. What are the key stocks you should be following in each of those sectors? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the final bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller, chief market strategist at stockcharts.com, usually from Redmond, Washington, today from Las Vegas, Nevada, here in town for the Money Show Investment Masters Symposium, which is a great title for an event. And I'm thrilled to be included in, in, with any implication that I'm an investment master. I'll take it. Uh, but it's a really good two day, uh, three day event actually down here. I'm here today and tomorrow uh, meeting with a lot of, uh, of people doing a couple different presentations and uh, trying to spread the good word of technical analysis. We're gonna be focusing on charts that are the most important to follow between now and year end and beyond, right? What are the charts to really track to focus on the changing market conditions? And the big part of what we're gonna talk about are some of the themes that we've been reflecting on uh, on the final bar in recent uh, weeks and really in recent months is leadership rotation away from growth and into value. We're seeing a bit of that again today with healthcare energy uh, at the top of the uh, of the return list. Uh, utilities as well, which is sort of an interesting one, uh, sort of a defensive sector at the top. Uh, we're going to talk about the FANG stocks and what we've seen, which ones are still working, which ones are starting to struggle, what we would need to see to sort of confirm that rotation away from the mega cap leadership that's been dominating things. I'm excited today to bring back a segment we used to do often called Banking on Breadth. Breadth indicators are a key part of my uh, focus as an analyst, and I'm, I'm really excited to be working at a place like Stock Charts, where breadth indicators are really central to the product and uh, uh, really some deep and and, uh, and impressive breadth capabilities. So we're going to look at some of the indicators that I think tell the story of what's happening here. We'll talk about the improvement in breadth and now some of the decline in breadth readings and what that might mean for the markets in this seasonally weaker period of August and September. We have a lot of charts to go through, including a couple earnings names to throw around as well here in our market recap. Let's get right to it. Before we, uh, by the way, get to the recap, I do want to start with a poll. We asked you recently, uh, which of the FANG stocks are the FANG stocks performs best over the next three months? Of course, we're familiar with these names, Meta, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Alphabet. You know, looking at the results, the most common response, 36% goes to Amazon, Alphabet, or Google number two at 27%. After that, Meta, Apple, Netflix with only 5% of the vote. So of course, two things that I'm always drawn to when I when we do a poll like this. Number one, what got the most votes? And I would not disagree with, uh, with uh, something like Alphabet, or or, uh, or Amazon, which are the two uh, best, uh, two most common responses. And the reason why I think those two stocks are setting up pretty well, we've talked about some of the leadership names like Apple, uh, Microsoft, of course, which wasn't included, you know, sort of breaking down through their 50-day moving average, getting hit with an earnings uh, miss here recently. And you're seeing a lot of the weight coming off of those mega cap technology names. But elsewhere in FANG world, looking at Amazon and consumer discretionary, looking at Alphabet and communication services, these stocks have actually pulled back to an ascending 50-day moving average, and now have rotated higher. Alphabet getting up, or excuse me, Amazon getting above resistance around 135. I think it's a nice follow through after pulling back to the 50 day, kind of pushing higher. Now from after that gap, you really haven't had any additional buying power. And I think that could be an important tell on a chart like Amazon, right? Look at how we gapped higher. And on that gap day, we pretty much, that was the high uh, for this little uh, three day period here. So what I would love to see is additional buying power come in to push Amazon uh, to uh, to further upside. I probably would uh, vote Alphabet given the choice only because it's put in a nice clear higher low around 127, 128. That lines up with the high that we saw in June just a couple months ago. So overall, I think that's setting up really nicely, kind of a classic uh, setup pattern. Of course, I'm always interested in the charts that got very few votes and Netflix only 5%. I'm actually pretty surprised because if you look at this chart, it's kind of a nice, long and strong up and to the right sort of chart. I think on Netflix, to be honest with you, that support level 
uh, here around, we'll call it 410, 420, I think is important to hold. As long as we hold that on any drawdown, I think this chart is still okay. We get below that, then we're below the 50-day below support. And I think that chart goes from looking pretty strong to actually a lot weaker. Thanks for uh, responding to that poll, by the way. All of our polls are sent out through our YouTube channel. So make sure you subscribe to that and also on our social media accounts. So follow us on Twitter, anywhere else you can find the Stock Charts TV Let's continue on with our market recap, looking at the dashboard and just seeing what's happened through the course of the day today. I mentioned initial sell-off and then a nice rally going into the close. The S&P was down quite a bit in the first hour, hour and a half of trading, but sort of turned on a dime with the major equity averages and pushed higher through the course of the day. The S&P literally almost trading to the penny to 4,500 uh, as we uh, close the session today. So we talked about big round numbers, we talked about 4,500 as a good line in the sand. Very interesting to me that we went well below that, but by the end of the day had recovered that key level. So we're holding 4,500 by my read until, uh, until further notice. The S&P finished down 0.4%. The NASDAQ composite uh, down 0.8%. Mid caps and small caps all in the red as well. You'll notice all the major benchmarks, again, with a nice rally in the afternoon, still finished the day uh, in the red. The only green you see on this front page is the VIX pushing back above 16. Now, the VIX actually went quite a bit higher uh, earlier in the day today. So if you look, here's the two-day chart of the VIX. Uh, and just zooming into today, you can see we went all the way up to an 18 handle before coming back to 16. So the volatility is incredibly volatile. So read into that what you want. I would say this means uh, excessive uncertainty and certainly not a stable environment. This is an unstable environment. Instability, I think, is the word of the day here so far for August. Looking at interest rates, you see the uh, yield curve for the most part moving lower, 30, 10-year, and five-year points all moving down just a little bit. 10-year yield finishing the day around 4.03%, 30-year yields just above 4.2%. It strikes me as I was looking at the, uh, the uh, session listing for the Money Show Symposium here uh, in Las Vegas this week. Uh, one of the presentations talking about uh, interest rates going straight down is <laughs> saying rates are going back to you know minimal levels. This is why income stocks are a really good bet because rates are going down and that's going to be your income opportunity. I saw another session talking about dealing with a rising rate environment and what the implications are for that. So I, I think there's a lot of uh, speculation right now about the future direction of interest rates. No doubt we've had a rising rate environment that has had a lot of implications. I think the question is what happens next. I agree more with uh, the conversation I had with Jeff Huge last week, which is talking about a rising rate environment, the implications of a rising rate environment or, or a period of uh, a sort of chronic high rates, which we've not experienced for quite some time. And what that means, unfortunately, for growth stocks is just not a very hospitable environment. And so I think the idea that the markets could rally driven by growth leadership, I think for now, those days are behind us. The question is, do you see some other areas of the market starting to improve? And that's what we're starting to see on uh, a day like this with things like energy continuing to move higher. The dollar index up about a half a percent. That might be something to watch because uh, a stronger dollar in this sort of environment usually doesn't tend to be a particularly good thing. At times, we've called that the wrecking ball for risk assets up a bit today. Gold and silver prices moving lower, and it's interesting to see how gold has continued to rotate lower. It's not really a broken chart, uh, but it's not a great chart. And, and again, when you're thinking of technical analysis, I tend to think of the good, bad, and in the middle bucket. So those are the general ways. When I look at a chart for the first time, immediately sort of assign it one of those buckets. And that that's based on the phase, right? Are we in an accumulation phase, an uptrend a distribution phase, a downtrend, or a consolidation phase, a sideways trend. I would label gold as probably in that third bucket, that consolidation phase, and it's been testing support. But I'm looking at a chart like the GDX, for example. It's actually starting to break down through support. Now, it might be an important space to watch if you've been leading into gold or gold stocks uh, here recently. Crude oil prices a little bit to the positive, uh, but not too much. Kind of mixed results overall in uh, uh, commodity land. Looking at cryptocurrencies, a lot of green. If you look through the course of the equity trading session, uh, quite a bit of, a, of an upswing there for, for cryptos. Bitcoin, once again, getting near that 30,000 level. And as I've mentioned many times, I think Bitcoin above 30,000 is a pretty constructive chart. Bitcoin failing to get above 30,000, which is what has been happening now for a couple of months, it's just not a great chart. And again, thinking of it in, in phases, it's sort of in that wait and see phase, that sideways phase, until we can get above 30,000 and stay there. So I'm impressed by the move we have today. I'd love to see some upside follow through above key resistance. Let's look at a daily chart of the S&P, just see what happened today. And you might notice if you're a candle fan, 
Um, the uh, pattern we've seen here, I'll zoom into just the last couple of months, you can see it. The chart of the S&P, along with the chart of, uh, you know, the SPY, of course, a lot of, uh, a lot of key stocks, uh, giving what you probably would label uh, a hammer candle. Uh, you might want to call it like a dragonfly doji, I guess, is the other potential label. It depends on how close you consider the open and close. When you have the open and close right around the same level and both at the upper end of the range and a long lower shadow, uh, that's usually labeled a hammer candle. Uh, and, and what that means is we've had a downtrend. We opened, we traded lower, but by the close, we're back up toward the highs of the day. And if you think about it, it's sort of like the market coming down to a trampoline and now bouncing back up and usually implies the next one to three bars are higher rather than lower. And that's in the back of my mind as I'm looking at the daily chart of the S&P, thinking through the remainder of this week. Candles like this popping up on the S&P suggest to me uh, we may get a, a bit of a short term bounce here. Now, the bigger picture, of course, is we're sort of in this uh, framework of resistance around 4,600. That was the peak we set uh, just a couple of weeks ago. I, you know, or uh, yeah, about about 10 uh, trading sessions ago, we'll call it. So getting about 4,600, of course, completes or continues that pattern of higher highs and higher lows. I think that's encouraging. The S&P, I think the downside risk for a tactical pullback would be around here. The 50-day moving average trend line support currently around 44.20. Uh, you know, we appear to be aiming down toward that level. I think that's still possible. That would also line us up with the lows from early July. We break that, and all of a sudden, I think you have to start thinking about further downside support and think about the potential for uh, a further retrenchment from some of these uh, uh, key names that have been driving the market higher through uh, July, now starting to take a bit of a break. But again, in the short term, candle pattern today actually suggesting short-term strength over the next one to three bars. Interesting maybe how that fits into uh, the uh, the bigger picture with uh, inflation data, other uh, uh, data coming uh, later this week. Let's keep going. Talking about some of the uh, some of the items uh, I think of interest. When I'm looking at the QQQ again, we've talked about growth leadership and uh, and uh, the Qs are the, I think a great way of just focusing on that mega cap growth trade and how it's been doing. If you look, the chart of the QQQ really at a key decision point. Right, it's pulled back to an ascending 50 day moving average. Uh, and I think that's, you know, for now, I think that's a decent level to expect support with any chart, right? And going back to our poll, uh, if look at Alphabet, look at Meta, look at um, Amazon, some of these names, these are stocks that have bounced off of their 50-day moving average. That, that happens so often that a lot of trading systems and platforms like uh, William O'Neill's methodology often focused on the 50-day or the 10-week uh, moving average as a key potential entry point if you have a long-term uptrend and you get some short-term weakness. So the reason why I think that's important to highlight is the Nasdaq's kind of there now. Uh, also, you'll note if you look here, and I can make a little candle pattern, uh, candle chart here really quick. I have a um, chart style called candle focus. If you look, we're just right almost to the 50 day moving average. We get this hammer candle that really suggests the next couple of days are most likely higher rather than lower. So it's interesting to me that you got that uh, sort of pullback to the 50 day. We're getting some bullish candle patterns. And again, that's not a long term buy signal by any stretch. It's more of a tactical signal. But I might tell you that this initial pullback maybe as a, as a break of sorts, the cues get below the 50 day moving average. I think that sort of uh, thesis is off the table. You want to be looking for further downside uh, protection uh, or ways to think about or ways to position yourself for further downside. I mentioned gold and gold stocks. The GDX is one of those places to look. I think what's concerning about the chart of gold is this move here. You know, recently we're bouncing off of support or testing support from late June, right around twenty nine dollars for the GDX, which is uh, not uh, gold uh, spot gold. This is actually looking at gold stocks. Uh, but I think what's more concerning is this move here, right? We retested the June swing high, traded a cut, maybe a point higher, but really stalled out there, really didn't follow through above resistance. What concerns me is the momentum, right? So the RSI topped out right around 60, and now we're retesting the lows. That's really more classic uh, behavior for a bearish phase or a distribution phase than an accumulation phase. And I think we're right at that point, testing support around 29. We get much below current levels. And I think you have to confirm a breakdown out of uh, support that would be below the 200 day moving average, which it broke down through about a week ago. Even if you label this like a symmetrical triangle, which probably isn't my favorite label, but I could get the argument of lower highs and higher lows. We've now broken below that trend line support. So I am I think we're at the very last level, which is testing the swing low around 29. Gold stocks, unfortunately, very close 
to uh, registering a bit of a sell signal there. AMD is another one as well. Semiconductor names have been under pressure here recently. The relative strength of semiconductors has been less ideal than it's been recently. If you look, AMD is actually testing support here once again, around 106, 107, we'll call it. That was the swing low. We made a new swing high in June, pulled back to around 107. We bounced up, made a lower high, and now we're once again bouncing off of support. So AMD's kind of caught in this range between around 107 on the lower end and 120 on the upper end. I'd be very keen to say which way we break out of this range. But given the fact that we've stalled out trying to make new swing highs, I would say a break lower is the more likely direction there. But a break below 107, the RSI breaking below 40, those are the things I would be looking for on this chart. It's not quite broken yet, but it's certainly stalled out and no longer going up. So again, for me, it's uh, for now in sort of a consolidation phase. A lot of financials in the news here, a lot of the banks uh, uh, getting downgraded uh, before the open today, if I remember right. And so that's causing pressure on things like the KRE, which is a regional banking ETF, the KBE, which is a uh, bank's ETF. What's interesting though, is if you look at what happened during the session today, we opened and traded lower, but by the end of the day, we actually closed back to the high. So the KRE, the regional banking ETF, still down 1.3%, but that's after recovering pretty nicely from a from a really weak open. This, uh, you know, right in the first 30 minutes of trading, looked like this could just be really uh, accelerating to the downside. But buyers came in earlier in the day and pushed, uh, you know, broadly speaking, pushed. Uh, the stock market back up to finish near the highs of the day. But some of those financial stocks that have been struggling also got a bit of a bid. The KBE, kind of a similar type of pattern here. In this case, we're testing the 200-day moving average. We broke above it a couple of weeks ago, but now it's stalled out right around that level. Today, we opened below, but then closed back above it. So I'm actually seeing some interesting buying power enter into the picture through the course of the day for uh, some of the financial stocks that have been struggling earlier in the day, actually having a nice finish. Healthcare uh, having a decent day as well. And charts like Eli Lilly, really surprising to the upside, providing some upside momentum uh, for the XLV, the healthcare uh, ETF. LLY is the ticker for uh, Eli Lilly. It's in the pharmaceutical space, of course, gapping higher by about 15%. Now, this is after bouncing off of the 50-day moving average for the last couple of weeks. So yet another argument for buying you know, pullbacks to a 50-day you know, in case this sort of move happens. So a nice pullback to support, a nice gap higher with something like this. I'm always interested to see the next day or two. Do you see additional buying power, additional buyers willing to pay even more uh, and $500, a big round number at the lower end of today's session, now the upper end of this uh, gap? I'd like to see if that cap can hold. And if so, I think that's a pretty decent uh, setup with further upside potential. Abbott Labs is another one. This actually traded lower today. So same group, pharmaceuticals actually trading lower. It did close above the 200-day moving average, but think about Lilly gapping higher, Abbott the other way, sort of moving lower through the course of the day. Now, what's interesting about Abbott is we have resistance in January, in April, in May, again in July. So it's not as much about today's action that concerns me on this chart. It's the inability to get above resistance. So I think after that sort of behavior over the last six months, I'd probably be happy be pretty, being pretty patient and waiting to see if we can get above that resistance and hold it. That's it for our market recap. A lot of charts to focus on, a lot we didn't get to, but I encourage you to use our scanning engine, the screening tools on stock charts to really focus on some of those names on the move to think about the technical setups going into today and what you might want to think about going forward. Before we get to our next segment, Banking on Brett, just want to remind you, our mailbag, would love to have some more questions in there. Getting a little bit empty. Would you help us out? Send us a question. What are you running into as you're analyzing your own charts, looking at positions, looking at potential trades, trying to use the technical analysis toolkit? Let us know what questions you're running into via email. That's the best way. The final bar at stockcharts.com. And do me a favor, just include a permalink through the chart that you're looking at. Both our Sharp Charts and our ACP platform, you can share a permalink. That hyperlink will let me look at the exact chart that you're looking at with your question. On social media, just tag us in Twitter on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV and on our YouTube channel. Just put a comment below the video you're watching. We'd love to answer your question in our next mailbag on Friday's show. Let's continue on today's show with our next segment, Banking on Breath. We used to do this one pretty regularly. I'm excited to get back to it because breath uh, analysis is really important to me. It's a core part of my toolkit, really helps me think about uh, some of the most important measures of participation. And that's what breadth really represents. It tells you whether, you know, regardless of what the major averages are doing, right, whether the S&P or the NASDAQ, 
or the Russell is going up or down. What breath conditions tell you are the conditions underneath the hood. What about all of those hundreds or thousands of stocks that comprise those indexes? Are they agreeing with what the larger, uh, the, the, the top level indexes are telling us? And when they don't, when they disagree, that can often be one of the most important signals of, a, of an impending market reversal. Now, if you look at what's happening with the advanced decline data, we'll look at a couple of different measures of market breadth. We've touched on some of these recently, but I think looking at them all together, you'll get a quick picture of the breadth conditions and really, I guess, to summarize how they really started to deteriorate. Now, the raw advanced decline data, not too bad yet. And this is looking at cumulative advanced decline lines for the New York Stock Exchange, large caps, mid caps, and small caps. And as a reminder, every day at the end of the trading day, you have the daily advancers versus decliners. How many stocks closed up? How many stocks closed down? And you take those values over time and you add or subtract as a running total and you get these, these uh, data series called a cumulative advanced decline line. I tend to focus on this top series, which is the New York Stock Exchange, common stocks only. So it, it uh, excludes things like closed end funds and bond funds and sort of non-equity things, uh, non-common stock listings on the New York Stock Exchange, just focusing on companies that are uh, publicly traded on the NYSE. If you look at what's happened here, I've color coded it green. This is a subjective Dave color uh, color coding just based on what I'm what I'm seeing on this chart and what I what I uh, how am I interpreting the movements. So there's nothing really rigorous about the color coding, just me as a placeholder. But if you look what's happened, I've color coded this green because of the break above the February peak. I think when the S and P uh, broke above its February high, that was a key signal telling you that the markets were in accumulation phase. Right, we finally broached above that uh, that um, February high, it was around 4,200. Uh, that suggested further upside potential. We've certainly followed through there getting you know well above 4,500, which is where we're at here uh, at today's close. But if you look at what's happened in the last couple of weeks, it's interesting to me that uh, in mid-July, we broke above the February peak. And then we've kind of stalled out here. And we mentioned on some of the uh, charts earlier uh, how you've had a nice run in 2023, but now it's kind of stalled out, right? And it's wait and see mode, wait to see if we continue the uptrend or if we start to uh, deteriorate further from what, what's happened so far. And I think on the MYSE uh, advanced decline line, you have that same sort of issue. It's not that it's a bad chart. It's not that it's a broken trend. It's just that it's not going up at the moment, it's sort of stopped going up. And so I, you know, in this sort of environment, I look to see if we break back below that level, which is kind of right where we're at today. For me, this gets pretty questionable if we break below the 50-day moving average. If we do start to come off a little bit, that's sort of my general way that I would probably color code this back to orange, which would tell me it's more neutral, telling me that there's not a lot of upside follow through in the breadth conditions. Large cap breadth, mid cap breadth, still fine. And I think above the uh, February high, so far continuing to follow through. The small cap breadth, notably, still has not broken above the February high. So it might be worth paying attention to uh, to that as well. So the, the advanced decline data, not horrible, but just certainly not as bullish as it was when we're breaking out and continuing to move higher. Now, another way I like to measure breadth are the percent of stocks above key moving averages. Here we have the S&P 500 at the top. As we've uh, mentioned a number of times, the S&P remaining above its own 50-day moving average, which is currently around 44.20. And not that you know the most perfect trading system in the world is to just look for when things break above or below the 50-day. I, I don't know if something like that is really going to be the most effective trading system you've ever found. But for me, as a quick and dirty, are we still going up or not measure, I think it's really, really helpful. Just as a... You you know, set an alert for when a chart like this breaks below the 50 day and then agree that you will revisit that trend and see if the conditions are still bullish. I think that's a really good use of something like the alert system and something like a 50 day moving average. So the S&P for now holding above its own 50 day. But if you look down below here, this is the percent of stocks above their 50 day in green. This is looking at the S&P 500. A couple of weeks ago, it was 90%. Nine out of 10 S&P stocks were above their 50 day moving average. As of today's close, it's down to 60%. So that means almost a third of the S&P, 150 some names, were above their 50-day moving average two weeks ago and now below. So while the S&P has held its own 50-day, a bunch of the S&P members have not done so. And I think that is where this indicator can be pretty helpful. If you just think of the market as the top level index, you're probably feeling like just fine, everything's okay. For me, when I'm looking at breadth conditions, I am reading this chart uh, as telling me that a lot of stocks have really started to break down and that could be a cause for concern. Now, where do you get really concerned on this? For me, it's when the indicators break below 50%. That's why I have this horizontal pink line on both of those 
uh, chart. So as long as we hold the 50% level, things might be getting a little squirrely in the short term, but long term, the conditions are still okay. We break that 50% level. That's where we, uh, I think, need to start questioning the bullish uh, thesis overall for the markets. Now, the reality is if things would sell off quickly, it does not take much for this indicator to get right below 50%, particularly the bottom one, the percent above their 50-day uh, moving average. That's what I'd be watching for on that chart. For now, it's more short-term week, but long-term still okay. Now, we've highlighted some of these recently. The McClellan Oscillator, of course, went below zero uh, uh, end of last week uh, into the beginning of this week. And for me, again, that's a short-term indicator that's telling you really about price swings. And it's indicating to me high likelihood we're in a corrective phase. Now, what you have to remember is the market can correct in one of two ways. It can correct in terms of price, like we saw in September, October of last year, February, March of this year. It can correct in time, which is what happened more in April and May, right? We had the McClellan oscillator go below zero. Price didn't really come off too much, but the uptrend stalled out, right? We sort of had a sideways phase before the uptrend resumed. So there's no guarantee as to what type of correction it's going to have. It just tells you most likely the uptrend we've been in up until that signal is most likely taking a breather. And I think that's the condition that we're in uh, here right now. We'll see if we can get back above zero. That would change that, uh, that point of view. But for now, uh, it tells me to think more on defense than on offense in the short term. Now, we highlighted the NASDAQ's bullish percent index because the end of last week, if I remember right, beginning of this week, we saw the uh, bullish percent index go below the 70% level. And this is, again, looking at the 100 members of the NASDAQ 100, looking at each of their point and figure charts and making the basic assessment. Is this still in an uptrend or a downtrend? And a downtrend as confirmed, uh, as defined as the point and figure chart has registered a new sell signal. What you can see is this indicator has clearly gone below 70%. And if you look back to the left at these red shaded areas, which are previous times when we've been above that 70% level, look at what happened when we come off, particularly when we've been above there for quite some time. The last two times that look most similar to this current uh, pattern would be August of last year and April of last year, which were before some pretty uh, significant drawdowns. I'm no guarantee again that that sort of uh, exact move is going to happen, but it de definitely tells me to be cautious given the fact that the breadth has rotated. Now, as of today's close, the S&P's bullish percent index also registering a sell signal. Again, I've gone back over the last 18 months or so, and I've highlighted the previous times when the indicator has been above 70%. These are the areas shaded in red. Look at the end of the red, red shaded areas, and you can see that these have tended to be some pretty meaningful uh, pullbacks. It's actually really interesting to note that in April, May, June, you really didn't even get above there because not enough of the S&P stocks had become, you know, had gotten a buy signal from their point and figure chart. That has now happened. That happened the first week in July, and now it's actually come out of that overbought region. So that's another sort of confirmational signal telling me that point and figure charts registering sell signal tells me that plenty of members of the S&P have now started to register, uh, uh, have rotated lower. And about 10% of the S&P here in the last couple of weeks have registered a, a sell signal on their point and figure charts. So what's interesting is if you look at those measures of breadth, you can see some of these changes from a bullish phase, a fairly constructive phase, to a much less constructive phase. Now, not all of them are negative, and I just want to finish with one of these that is still actually kind of constructive, which is the uh, new highs and new lows. Now, this is a uh, big picture uh, tool looking at high, uh, excuse me, 52-week new highs and new 52-week lows, and I'm doing it on a couple different buckets of stocks. Uh, the uh, s and is at top on a daily basis. Here we have the daily new highs minus the daily new lows. So if the histogram's in black, that means new more new highs than new lows on a given day. If it's red, that means more new lows than new highs on that particular trading day. We can also look at 52-week new highs and lows for the New York Stock Exchange, color-coded green and red in that second histogram down at the bottom, that same uh, measure looking at new highs and new lows on the S&P 500. Now, this chart, I would argue, is still fairly constructive, right? Because even on a day like today and, and so far this week, you've had more new highs than new lows. Now, a lot of stocks on any given day are not making a new 52-week high or a new 52-week low. And I would say very few of them doing that, given the fact that the market itself has pulled off of its swing high uh, and uh, you know no longer making a new 52-week high on a given day. But there are still a handful of stocks doing so. So new highs have been outpacing new lows. As a matter of fact, we haven't had new lows more than new highs since the end of May. For all of June and all of July and so far in August, 
on any given day, it's been more 52-week highs than 52-week lows. The moment I start to see red on this chart, all of a sudden it looks more like March, looks more like May, looks more like December of last year, which are more sort of the pullback phases where all of a sudden you have not a lot of new highs and you have way more stocks that are actually following through and making a new swing low and, and, and indeed a new 52-week low. So still constructive for now, but that's why I think this chart could be important to watch going forward now that we're in the seasonally weaker part of the year, particularly in August and September. Same thing here when you're looking at the New York Stock Exchange or the S&P. You're starting to see some red bubble up here as more and more names on a given day are making a new 52-week low. The way that this would change in a bearish sort of corrective phase, look back in March, look back in December, certainly look back in sort of September and October of last year for an extreme example of what happens when the market rotates. And when you stop getting new 52-week highs, you start getting stocks breaking below their previous low for the last 12 months. That tells you a market in distribution phase. Not yet, but I think this chart could be an important one to track that potential distribution phase for equities. Folks, we got to wrap this show and go right to the three and three, three charts in three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one, we're looking at the bullish percent index. I love doing that segment, banking on breadth. I hope we can do that with a little more regularity because it's good to sort of take a, I, I sort of, you know, uh, take them on a one-off basis and randomly pepper them into our market recap, or I'll use them as one of the three and three charts, but really forcing myself and going through with you together and going through each of them and thinking about sort of the weight of the evidence of all the different breadth indicators can be helpful. Made me think a little bit about what it tells me about leadership trends, what it tells me about the overall market conditions. At the end there, that chart about new highs and new lows telling me about the fact that some stocks are actually still breaking out. What are those names making new 52-week highs? Let me run the scan engine and focus on some of those areas continuing to show strength. The chart I wanted to share today is the S&P's bullish percent index today at the close, giving a, uh, a sort of classic sell signal, uh, rotating from an extreme bullish reading uh, above 70% to now more of a, uh, a bear uh, flag or what would you call it? A bear confirmed, I think they call it. Uh, where the uh, the bullish percent gets back below 70%. If you look back to the left on this chart uh, for the last 18 months, you can see the previous times when we've gone above that 70% level and come down. Again, there's no guarantee with any technical indicator, particularly with a broad market indicator, that this time is going to be anything like some of those previous times. But it certainly tells me the much more likely scenario here in August and September is that we follow the seasonal weaker patterns uh, that have tended to proliferate uh, over time, and it suggests that there might be further downside to be had there. Chart number two is looking at candle charts of Apple and the S&P 500. If you look at the chart of Apple in the top half of the screen, you can see what I would probably call a dragonfly doji candle. This is when the open and close are almost identical. You have very small upper shadow and a long lower shadow. That usually indicates short-term rally phase over the next one to three bars. I also want to include the SPY. Now, the S&P 500 chart actually had a bit of a uh, of a hammer candle. The SPY, not as much. So this changed by the time I put it on here. I don't know if I would label this uh, a doji candle or an accumulation candle of sorts. It tells me Apple may be short-term bounce, but the S&P, I think, still indeterminate when I look at what happened going into the close. Finally, the chart of Bitcoin. What's interesting to me is I think of, again, I think of the markets in phases. And when I look at the chart of Bitcoin, I would think of April, May, June, July, and now August as a uh, consolidation phase. We're not going down like we were in mid-22. We're not going up like we were at the beginning of 23. We're sort of sideways. And the way that I would define that sideways trend is 30, 31,000 on the upper end. That's the April high and the June and July highs. And then on the lower end, we have 25,000, which was the pullback that we had in June. At some point, we either break above the upper boundary or break below the lower boundary. And I would expect that momentum to continue in that uh, in that direction. For now, though, it's holding in there uh, just fine. Also note the momentum at the bottom with the RSI hanging in there around 40. Folks, that's it for uh, the final bar. Thanks so much for joining us every week day after a close. And especially thank you for hanging with us this week as I try to do the, the show remotely from Las Vegas. A lot of great interviews that we featured on the show. You can find all of them on our YouTube channel. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a great one.